Brothers and sisters, this past week on Thursday was Epiphany. And so we are uh, celebrating Epiphany today on uh, January the 9th. And for whatever reason, uh, I am not able to be with you physically this morning. I trust that we will be able to worship together in spirit and in truth, regardless of my lack of physical presence. This morning, we'll be looking at Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, and you already heard from, uh, from the uh, call to worship from Isaiah 60, verses 1 to 6. This is the passage that starts, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. It's such a beautiful passage, and of course, one of the one of the key passages in the work of Handel's Messiah. It is so beautiful. I'd sing it for you, but I am quite certain that I would not do it justice. Matthew chapter two, however, uh, is uh, there may be portions from it. However, uh, it is it is one of those passages that is key, and yet somehow we, we, we misplace it a little bit. Matthew chapter 2. This is what we read in verses 1 to 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, <coughs> excuse me, Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they, when they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary and his mother, with Mary his mother, excuse me, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, coming as it does so quickly on the heels of Matthew's uh, recording of the birth of Jesus, and because this story uh, contains information about Bethlehem and where the child was to be born, and Herod sends the wise men to Bethlehem, because of all those things, we have a tendency to think that these wise men were there uh, very shortly after the birth of Jesus, like within a, you know, a few days or something like that. Uh, and, and then we also have a tendency, because of the fact that three gifts were given, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, although that is it should probably be three categories of gifts as opposed to three gifts. But anyways, uh, because those three gifts or categories of gifts were given, we have this tendency to think that uh, therefore there were three wise men. But that, of course, is not necessarily true either. Uh, in, in fact, really, probably, this episode occurs 
uh, maybe a year, maybe even two years after the birth of Jesus. And, and the reality is, is that probably <clears throat> the wise men don't end up finding Jesus in Bethlehem, but they probably find him in Nazareth, or at least up in that area. And, and the the clues for this are, are right here in the passage. First of all, notice what the wise men say in, uh, in verse 2. Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. Right? Notice that they observed past tense, the rising of the star when Jesus was born, right? So it's not like the star came and shone before Jesus was born and gave them forewarning so that they could travel however long they needed to travel in order to be at uh, Bethlehem at the time of Jesus' birth. No, no, no probably pretty much simultaneously with the angels in the sky proclaiming their news to the shepherds in Bethlehem, probably at the same time this star appeared in the sky and wherever the wise men came from, the magi came from, they saw it from there and then they would have had to have made preparations to go and get their caravans together and whatever they needed to do, figure out what it all meant and everything like that, all of those things they would have had to have done. And then, in addition, they would have had to have traveled, of course. And, and traveling, we often forget, uh, I mean, we know it with our heads, but we, we forget the reality of what that was like. Traveling in those days involved walking or riding on camels or m more often both, right? And so when we think of the Magi, the wise men, as they come to visit Jesus, they are not coming. They are not coming right on the ding of Jesus' birth, but rather maybe even a year, a year and a half, two years later. The other reason we know that, that it would have been a, a somewhat substantial amount of time is that these kings, these uh, wise men, these, these uh, seers, these uh, magi, they are identified as being from the east. And, and that's all well and good, except that it indicates that they, they must have been far enough east, probably, that their actual country was unfamiliar, at least to Mary and Joseph, um, who received the Magi when they came. So you can imagine Mary or Joseph or, or something passing this story on to Matthew as Matthew is trying to write the gospel, or, or passing it on to other people who then, you know, pass that on to Matthew and he writes it down. Regardless, for whatever reason, Mary, at least, or Joseph, or both of them, they don't know. They're far enough away that they don't know where these magi come from. And, and so we know, again, that traveling any significant distance is going to take a significant amount of time. They can't just pop into a plane or a helicopter or a car and drive across land. They have to take their time. They have to eat along the way. They have to trade. They have to find places to sleep. They have to do all of those things, and it takes a long time. And then the next clue that we have is that, you know, Herod tells them to go and search for Jesus, and so they do. Presumably, they go first to Bethlehem. I don't know, but they, they go, and then the star leads them to the place where Jesus is found. But notice, notice what they say, or what is said of them. 2 verse 10 and 11. 
right? When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary and his mother and knelt down and paid him homage, right? So they enter the house where Jesus and Mary are. But notice that it's a house. It's not a stable, right? Mary and Joseph are clearly not with Jesus in the stable where Jesus was born because it says, on entering the house. So, Jesus is born, has grown up some. He is a toddler. Maybe he's even walking around. Maybe he's saying a few words. Um, and the Magi come, and they worship and pay homage to this little boy. Now, as to the gifts, there's a, a lot of thought, and I was just talking about this with, uh, with some fellows on, uh, on a podcast the other day. Um, there is some thought that these gifts have particular significance. I mean, first of all, they are gifts that are worthy of a king. They are the kinds of gifts that, that foreign dignitaries would indeed bring to uh, the birth of a new king or the coronation of a new king and so on. However, <clears throat> they also, in this case, serve as particular gifts foreshadowing and supporting Jesus in a couple of things. First of all, we know that Herod, after he, is, he, he hears that the, the wise men have invaded him, uh, Herod goes on a rampage. But before Herod goes on this rampage, God warns Joseph in a dream that he is to take his family and flee to Egypt. And that's a whole nother interesting story where we've got sort of the reverse of of the Israelites freeing, fleeing from Egypt, and now Jesus fleeing to Egypt. And there's some interesting parallels there. But in this particular case, the theologians think that, you know, quite possibly these gifts of gold <clears throat> especially helped to pave the way for them to go to Egypt, to fund that trip. Because for a carpenter and his young family, this would not have been a very financially viable option. And so the gold could perhaps have gone to uh, funding this trip, uh, this fleeing to Egypt. And then uh, the frankincense and myrrh are often involved in the embalming or anointing processes. And so it, it, it's a hint of Jesus anointing as the Messiah and a hint of how Jesus would be buried royally. And we think that perhaps when Jesus is buried and the ladies are taking care of him, perhaps it is some of the myrrh that is used in the process of burial there. And so we can see that these gifts are significant, not just because they are kingly presents, but also because they are, they foreshadow what is to come. Now, we've talked about some of those details and that's great, but now we need to talk about epiphany. What is epiphany? What does it mean? Well, epiphany in, in the normal everyday sense is like a, a, a sudden and bright idea, right? It's like, uh, you know, when people say, Eureka, right? I found it. Or, or when people go, oh, I remember now. Or, oh, that, yeah, yeah, I know how to do that. Or whatever, right? Those sudden inspirations, right? Like if you have in the cartoons, like a light bulb showing up on somebody's head, that is an epiphany. And so when Jesus is revealed to these people, that is an epiphany, right? When the star shines in the night, <laughs> an almost very literal light bulb in the sky, the wise men get the idea, and then they respond to it. 
It's a, it's a little bit like I was listening to the radio the other day. Um, Salvador Dali, who was a, a famous painter, he had this he had this idea that that the best way to foster creativity within himself and for others too was to was to sit in a in a comfortable chair with like a a heavy metal object or bell or whatever in one hand and to sit and just allow oneself to drift off to sleep. And when they drift off to sleep, when Salvador Dali drifted off to sleep, he would loosen his grip quite naturally on the heavy metal object, which would then clatter to the floor and startle him awake. And, and while that sounds vaguely torturous to me, it is, however, he thought the way to inspire creativity, that, that in that space between sleeping and waking, where you're just drifting off, that is where the most epiphanies occur. And in fact, there have been some studies done about this recently. <clears throat> and scientists found that actually it was true. What they did was they got a whole bunch of people in to do math problems. And, and there was some theme or some trick that, that connected all these math problems that if the people just had an epiphany, they could notice that theme, that connection, and they could solve all the problems very easily from there on. And so they got all these people in, and the people who knew right away what the theme was and, and how it could be solved, they were dismissed because they, they already knew. <clears throat> and then they had the remaining people either have no nap at all, or to have a nap in the style of Salvador Dali, where they would sit in a chair and have their heavy metal object and it would drop and they would wake up and, and see how that went. And then they would have another group that would just have as long a nap as they wanted. And, and they found out, actually, that the people who slept as Dali did, did the best. They were the ones who figured out this solution, this trick, quicker than either of the other two groups. In fact, uh, you know, as much as this is sad for, for me, who likes to have a nice long nap, the group who took the naps that were as long as they wanted did the least well. And, and the group that stayed awake, they kept plugging away at it, and they did, yeah, okay. But the group that fell asleep and then startled awake, they did the best. This is epiphany. It is the connection between the mystical and the, the spiritual and the dreamlike and reality. Right? The, not reality as in these things aren't real, but reality as in the stuff we touch every day when we're wide awake. Right? And, and, and the wise men, they knew this. They, they both saw the world as it really was in our day-to-day, -day, everyday existence, but they also knew and dreamed of a world that could be so much better. And in the connection of those two things, with the star shining in the sky, they saw the revelation of Jesus. Why else would they come from miles and miles and miles away to worship the king of the Jews. Why else would they do that except that they see in Jesus a revelation of something far more significant than just the king of a small country far away? They saw in him 
salvation. They saw in him something bigger for the whole world. And this is a huge part of the tension that we live in, too, brothers and sisters. It is so easy for us to live in the waking world, to plod along, plugging away at the various problems that we have, perhaps getting disillusioned by them and struggling with them, but nonetheless slogging away at it, trying to get stuff done in our own strength, and maybe we do okay. Or, or, <coughs> or maybe, maybe it is so easy for us to just lull ourselves into sleep. To shut our eyes from the difficulty. To hide away from the struggles. To pretend like none of it is there. To sleep as long as we want. But we need to live in that tension, that tension of, of the hope for something that can be so much better and the reality of things as they are today. The, the tension of the reality of Jesus' salvation for us and the reality that I am not yet what I will be. Now I see through a glass darkly. Then I will see face to face. This is epiphany. Realizing a little child is savior of the world. The Messiah. The very son of God become one with us. Emmanuel, God with us. So brothers and sisters, this, this year, this week, this day, let us not, let us not live in the mundane reality of everyday life alone. And let us not also shut our eyes and dream of a fantasy world that is just sloughing all our troubles aside. But instead, let us live in the real tension of the, the dream and vision of something true and right, the sure, strong hope of Jesus. And in the reality of the everyday, let us live in epiphany and let us help others too to see that reality truth that truth and reality as well that they too can live beyond the mundane and they too cannot shut themselves off in some fantasy world but instead we can live in the truth of God with us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for epiphany, for this reality that, that we are living in the strong, sure hope and reality of Jesus' salvation for us and the reality of what is to come, the new heaven and the new earth, where all things will be finally made totally and completely right. And we are also living in a day that is struggling, that is difficult, that is full of trouble. May we live in that tension. May we, like Dali, be startled awake anew every day. Startled awake into the creativity and reality of your truth and of this world. And may we share that hope together with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.